Um, so thank Carl, you know, for allowing me to speak to your students. Um, I do give lectures on Gramsci here, uh, but as part of a course on theory and method, uh, not uh, a freestanding course or a freestanding uh, course on Marxism. And historicism, as you know, is very central to my thinking. I'm actually going through uh, the uh, proofs of uh, debate, uh, which will be published next year, you know, between uh, the very well-known Canadian political theorist, uh, James Tully. Uh, he wrote a very, very interesting uh, paper, which I think all of you should read. It's a long paper, uh, not a very easy paper, but I think it's a very good paper called Deparochializing Political Theory. It has something to do with the enterprise that we are engaged in in India. And um, I wrote a response to his paper, and he has now written a very long response to our responses. And uh, the question of historicism is quite central. And what I liked was last night I was reading it, and um, he sees my thinking as a historicist. I myself say that you know, I'm a historicist. Uh, he also sees my thinking as a historicist. So thinking about historicism, what historicism means is very important for so I shall talk about Gramsci's historicism uh, today. And I shall divide my talk into three, four parts. First, I shall talk a little bit briefly about what is historicism, or what Arun started out with, because there are different ways in which the conceptual term historicism is used. Then, um, I shall talk about uh, two paths in Marxism, one of which is historicist and the other which is hostile to historicism. Then, in the main part of my lecture, I shall talk mainly about Gramsci. And I'll say that there are six different intellectual moves or arguments in Gramsci, which are all very significant to Gramsci, which are all historicist moves. And finally, I shall keep a little bit of time for thinking about why should we and how should we read Gramsci. And uh, I shall argue that there are two ways of reading Gramsci. Uh, the first of which I followed when I wrote some papers in the 1980s following Gramsci. But gradually, the meaning of what it means to follow Gramsci has changed in my mind. And I shall talk a little bit about that at the very end. So first, I think I shall take about uh, you know, 40 to 50 minutes, and then uh, we should have a discussion. I don't have any constraint of time, right? So I learned historicism through Gramsci. And I also understood Gramsci through historicism, which means purely biographically from the point of view of how I came upon this body of thinking, which is called historicism. When <coughs> I grew up in Kolkata, uh, when we were very young, there was no discussion of Gramsci. Gramsci's name became familiar in Kolkata, I think, in the very early 70s, uh, initially through a short collection called Modern Prince and Other Writers. <coughs> <laughs> where there was the essay Modern Prince, and I think some small bits from Britain Notebook. But very soon after that, I think we had the selection from Britain Notebook, which came out of England. Uh, and uh, so that was our introduction to Gramsci. Mm -hmm. So when I read Gramsci, I immediately realized that. Uh, you know, this was a form of thinking which was very different from the predominantly Leninist, or you can call it Stalinist, I'll call it Leninist. Lenin and Stalin, I think, on the question of history, occupy slightly different positions. I shall talk about that in a minute. But uh, I immediately felt 
wine to eat in Gramsci that the flavor of this writing, the flavor of this thinking was completely different from what I had read before. But at that time, I did not know where it came from, you know, what historicism really meant. And this is also quite interesting that, you know, the way we understand thinkers is inevitably determined by the sequence in which we have read them. So if I had been a German student and I had read uh, Hegel when I was doing my BA in college and then read Gramsci, my understanding of Gramsci would have been of one kind. But I read Gramsci and Hegel in the opposite sequence. In fact, I read Gramsci first with great interest and respect. And it, only then I gradually went into a serious reading and grappling with Hegel. Um, and then afterwards, when I went to Oxford, I realized that some of the discussions about political theory at that time essentially is centered around the work of Quentin Skinner, John Donne, John Pocock, etc., which was very topical. It just uh, started uh, there in the last uh, 10 years or so. I gradually realized that you know the philosophical arguments in those essentially came from German historicism. And influence of German historicism came to these people, these English writers, through a man called Collingwood, who wrote a book called The Idea of History, a very famous book at one time. I would recommend that to you. Which is a kind of Collingwood. Calling. Sorry? Um, uh, there is disturbance. Uh, uh, please, uh, somebody has to unmute. Uh, somebody okay. has to mute. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, calling board, uh, the idea of history. But uh, I realized that, you know, calling board presentation is a kind of simplification of the German ideas. And I thought that I should look at the German philosophers themselves directly. And then I read three great historicist thinkers quite closely when I was in Oxford. Uh, Schleier Markert, who was uh, before Dilthey, who is the originator of the modern hermeneutic uh, tradition in Germany, then uh, Dilthey, and finally uh, Gadamer, uh, Truth and Method by Gadamer, which had a, exercised a huge, huge influence in my thinking, because I felt that if we really wanted to understand what historical thinking means. That is, when we say that I want to think about something historically, um, I really understood that by reading Gadamer. But reading Gadamer also confirmed an idea that I had about Marx, because I felt that you know, Marx was also a historicist. And because I did not know historicism very well, I could not make that argument to myself or to others very convincingly. It's reading Gadamer which actually allowed me to understand the problem of historicism more closely, and then allowed me to make the argument, which I make now quite regularly, that unlike most other people who do not see Marx as a historicist, I personally feel that Marx is a great historicist thinker. And the trajectory of historicism should start with Hegel, come to Marx, and then come to Schleiermacher, Dilthey, Gadamer, etc. Anyway, I want to turn now to <coughs> the question of historicism. So what is historicism? Historicism is a term which is not used by Hegel. Historicism is a term which is essentially invented by neo-Kantian thinkers in Germany at the turn of the century, particularly by Wilhelm Dilthey, uh, who is the originator of the distinction between two types of science, uh, science meaning Wissenschaft in German. Wissenschaft does not mean science like natural science. Wissenschaft is a term which is much closer to our Sanskrit term Shastra, uh, which is systematic knowledge about a particular cognitive field. It does not necessarily mean knowledge which is arranged like natural science and knowledge which has the quality of accuracy, experimentalism, et cetera, which are displayed by 
natural science. It simply makes a body of knowledge which is highly systematic. So Dilthai made a distinction between two types of knowledge, two branches of knowledge, the Naturwissenschaften, that is sciences of nature, which sought explanation of things through the main category of cause. And uh, what he called, on the other hand, Geist is Wissenschaften. Geist means spirit. Uh, it's a term which is taken from Hegel, in Hegel's sense of the term. Uh, sciences of the spirit or sciences of the mind, that is, sciences of society, which is called sciences of the mind because society is created by the efforts of the human mind, which is reflected on the one side in the creations of the human mind in the form of literature, art, philosophy, but it is also created by the creations of the human mind, which are more congealed in social form as social institutions. So social institutions, which is what we study in history, you know, making of social structures, the breaking of social structures, their transformation. These are all studies of the human mind in the Hegelian sense, because Hegel would say that any textual writing <clears throat> is an objectification of the mind, and social structures, institutions, politics, these are also other objectifications of the mind. So it is objective mind which is reflected in that. So Dilthai invents the term historicism. What does historicism mean in Dilthai? Historicism, this is the crucial point. Dilthai believes that the movement of natural science is to look at individual uh, items of fact, you know, some <coughs> chemical process or a physical process, <coughs> and then try to gather together a large number of facts of a similar kind, then say what the similarities are, and then try to group them together under wider and wider, larger and larger, more and more general laws. So, uh, natural science actually seeks to produce a kind of pyramid of knowledge that is at the lower end, the empirical end, you have a lot of diversity of individual cases. But the process of knowledge is to move towards and seek uh, larger and larger generalization, law like generalization. So that ultimately, scientists would actually seek for something which they call a theory of everything, that is, some kind of formula by which everything in the universe can be explained. Now, <coughs> Dilthai thought that uh, the movement of social science is in the opposite direction. In history, what we try to understand are not causes. History tries to understand reason, which is linked to the human mind. History tries to understand human action. The human world is a world of action. And we cannot understand an action if we do not understand why a particular person undertook that action, what he intended to do. Does not mean that what he intended to do would be successfully accomplished, that he would be able to do what he wanted. No revolution ever accomplishes what it wants to do. But you cannot understand a revolution if you do not understand what the revolutionary wanted to do. So capturing the intention, capturing the reason behind an action in the human mind is the central part of historical social sciences, <coughs> which he called Geist And the result of that very briefly is that in history, this is Dilthai, Marxism would not entirely agree with this. Dilthai believes that therefore the task of history is to look for particularity. And no human creation is undeserving of respect. So whether we are trying, looking at a tribal society, very old tribal society. In ancient times, a tribal society today, or a highly evolved society like the American society of today or the Indian society today. What we are trying to understand is what makes that society unique, unlike any other society. And when we fully understand all the features which makes that society unlike 
all other societies <coughs> in human history, we uh, we are successful. So that is the nature of uh, of human knowledge. And so this doctrine of history is called historicism. Later on, the term historicism is used by very famously by Karl Popper. You will see that the meaning in which I use the term historicism, which is the old Gilthai uh, meaning. <coughs> and if you think of historical thinkers, then in this definition, then historical thinkers are like Hegel, um, Gilthai himself, Steinmacher, Gartemacher, etc. The people who are hermeneutic thinkers, they are the historical thinkers. Let's say somebody, if you take the American scene, somebody like Clifford Gear. Uh, <clears throat> is historicism. He thinks that what you need to do is a thick description of human action and human society. Now, the term historicism is used by Karl Popper in a famous book called The Poverty of Historicism, which was written at the height of the Cold War, uh, <coughs> in which he arbitrarily uses the term historicism to condemn thinkers like Hegel and Marx and he uses the term historicism to mean a few things. And it's important to see the distinction because when you read the literature, you will see that um, historicism, for instance, Deepak Chakravarti in his uh, Provincializing Europe uses historicism totally in the second meaning, uh, ab never in the first meaning. I find that a bit odd because in my uh, own writing, I do not want to make too much of a uh, point about that, which meaning you use. But I think you should be clear about which meaning you are using. Uh, you should not give the impression that there is only one meaning <coughs> to the term because that confuses the issue. But the second meaning of historicism focuses on a couple of things. It uh, focuses on many things, but mainly two things. Popper was strongly opposed to Hegel and Marx, because he thought that Hegel and Marx were advocating a philosophy of history, which said, suggested that the whole of history is tending in a particular kind of direction. So it's a teleological process. It begins in many different places differently, but ultimately it would reach a certain type of, you know, concluding uh, terminal point. So that is the understanding of teleology. So. Uh, an understanding of history which is teleological, an understanding of history which is completely comprehensive, and therefore a belief that you can get a key, something like a law of history, you know, which can give you a sense of this kind of teleology, right? That is the meaning of historicism in Popper's writing. If you read Poverty of Historicism and Open Society and Its Enemies, these are the two books which uh, popularize this idea of historicism. And Americans immediately picked up the second meaning of historicism because many of them were not familiar with the first meaning. It created a confusion. But I do not, as I said, I think it's very important to keep the two meanings separate in our mind. And <clears throat> when I use the term historicism, I use it in the first sense, in the sense in which it's used by the Germans. Let me now turn to, uh, to strands of Marxism. Why is the invocation of the term historicism important in the study of Marxism? I think if we look at the historical elaboration of Marxist theory, gradually, to oversimplify, it splits into two parts. <coughs> Very quickly. There's a path which you can call Hegelian. So, Lukas is a Hegelian Marxist, Gramsci is a Hegelian Marxist, uh, lots of others are Hegelian Marxists. And then there's a path which is anti Hegelian, which believes that uh, you know, Marxist thinking should be gradually rescued from its entanglement with Hegel. And the more you do that, the better. And the people who take the second view, they also take a view of Marxism as a sign. For instance, 
Lenin said famously that Marxism is all powerful because it's true. And uh, he also, Engels also sometimes uses the invocation that Marxism is scientific. <clears throat> and we can see that the meaning of scientific in the second tradition, the anti theorian tradition, evolves in a way which assimilates Marxism more and more to an understanding of science which is deeply wedded to natural science, which uh, leads to uh, a positivistic understanding of, of Marxism. Positivism meaning, uh, positivism is a term which means that the method of science is unitary. It doesn't matter which field you are applying it to. So if you're a positivist, then you will believe in the methodological unity of the sciences. And you would also have to believe that the methods of natural sciences are shared by the social science. So it's a completely anti Dilthayan uh, position. And <clears throat> so I think the history of Marxism shows that Marxist philosophical thinking gradually breaks into two uh, strands. One is the more Hegelian, the more historicism friendly strand. And the other one, uh, which is anti Hegelian, and in my view, positivist, uh, becomes more and more a kind of anti-historical strand. And it is this strand which became more popular in the common time. But you must realize that, you know, Gramsci and Lenin, they're both uh, part of the common time. They're arguing inside the common time. But I feel that in, except in a few things, uh, Gramsci and Lenin evolve Marxism in ways, you know, where the spirit of Marxism becomes very different. I must make one point very quickly, that uh, Lenin, in spite of his general theory of history being positivist, in my view, uh, and uh, his using the term science, Marxism is a science, increasingly in a natural science kind of sense, uh, what um, you know, what specifies Lenin, what makes Lenin interesting, is that he has a very sharp sense of the situational. I think I have uh, said that in some of my writings on Indian Marxism recently, that Lenin's analysis are extremely acute um, understanding of the logic of situation um, through which he devises the, the theory of the Russian Revolution. And because of that, there is a strand in Lenin's thinking, which is opposed to the Stalinist assimilation, you know, a Stalinist tendency to look for positivistic laws in society. I'll give you one example quickly and then try, turn to Gramsci. Um, you know, think of Lenin's advice to the Indian communists. When they had a discussion about Comintern and the colonial question, uh, there is a difference of opinion between Trotsky and Lenin. So what Trotsky does is, Trotsky actually creates an argument that you get in Marx, uh, which is about late capitalism. I should start my discussion on Gramsci with that. You know, which said that if you look at the development of capitalism in Europe, you will find that there's not one path. There are at least two paths. One is the path which Marx called really revolutionary in the history of the revolutions in England and France. And he thought quite a distinctive path was being followed in countries like Germany, which Marx and Engels knew very well. But they also surmised that the same path would be followed in <coughs> countries where capitalism started late, like Italy and Russia. And Russian communists were deeply influenced by that. But the interesting thing is that if you look at the debates of the common turn about the common turn and the colonial question. Trotsky, for instance, says that when you go to India, India in India, capitalism is even more backward than in Russia. So the theory that we have of the Russian revolution, that the bourgeoisie is very reactionary and small, and it is isolated, and therefore it should be completely overthrown by an alliance of the proletariat and the peasantry. Trotsky has a famous saying where he says, the further east you go, the more reactionary becomes the bourgeoisie. So Trotsky's advice to the Indian communists would be that 
forget about the Congress. The Congress is the bourgeois uh, party. Try to overthrow it directly. And then you can take over the lead of the anti-colonial revolution, the anti-imperialist movement. Lenin totally disagrees with that. Actually, Emin Roy, uh, in this debate, sides with Trotsky. Lenin totally disagrees with that. Lenin says that, you know, a colonial situation is not like the Russian situation. The colonial situation is different. And there, the coalition of classes would be quite different. And the bourgeoisie should be an ally or the leader of the national movement. The communists should support the bourgeoisie and work with the bourgeoisie and not try to topple the bourgeoisie from the leadership of the national movement. So you see a difference. You know, in Trotsky, there's a tendency to see the law of late capitalism almost in a science, scientific law-like sense, natural science law-like sense, that wherever you go, you apply that law because it's, it's a law in that uniform sense. In Lenin, there's a tendency to suspend that and to say that you look at the historical situation more closely. But the important thing is that you know, Lenin does not develop a theory out of it. He simply sees it as a, a part of revolutionary intelligence, which must be very alive to the specificities and the particularities of a situation. So it's the skill in reading the logic of a situation rather than a theoretical point from which Lenin is making that observation. So <clears throat> then if we turn then to the Hegelian strand of elaboration of European Marxism, historicism comes to Gramsci through the expanding influence of Hegel all across Europe, and particularly through a great figure in Italian thought, that is Croce. Uh, Gramsci is a close reader of Croce. So uh, Gramsci has two routes to Hegel. One is a direct route of reading Hegel directly, Hegel's book. And sometimes uh, Hegelian ideas come to Gramsci, not directly from Hegel, but from their ingestion through Croce. Now let me turn to what I consider to be the main historicizing moves in Gramsci. And um, so I believe the paper that I uh, sent to Arun and which he probably circulated, uh, sees him as the primary theorist of historical difference in Marxism. So you must have read that. I don't want to repeat that. What I shall do is I shall focus on the six arguments that I see as distinctively historical. <coughs> so what is historicist about this? I want to make this point very sharply and provocatively because I want, you are all Indian students, you are not American or German students. So the whole point you are reading Marx or Gramsci or anything is to sharpen your intellect and thinking back on your own society. You know, you are not going to be scholars of German history. So that's why this point is very important. So what does historicism mean? Historicism means, and this is the primary moving Gramsci. This is why Gramsci is Gramsci. <coughs> historicism means <coughs> that Gramsci has at his command, in his disposal, a body of prior thought, which has theorized European, the history of European modernity. Uh, one is a great uh, system of Hegel, which is a theory of which is the theory of history, but which is also primarily a theory of European modernity. And the second <coughs> is Marx and the entire Marxist tradition, which has gone before Gramsci, and which has actually given them an already produced, you know, already performed theory. What is historicism? What is historicism doing? Historicism is asking a question to that body of thought. What does it do for me in trying to understand Italy? Right? And so the question then becomes, what are the things in which Italy is like England and Germany, England and France and Germany, so that I do not have to divide the theory for that, because there's already theory existing here. I can simply lift it from Marx or from Hegel or from others. But are there things in which Italy is very different from the rest of Europe? 
at least from England and France. If that is true, if Italy is very different from England and France in some respects, then that theory, although it comes from Marx and Engels, although it comes from other great European uh, prior thinkers, it would not work for me. I have to do something else in order to get at the history of Italy. So what makes Italian history different from other places, right? That is the central question of historicism. And I'm putting it so sharply because I want all of you, whether you are a Marxist or not, whether you are a supporter of CPM or BJP, it does not matter to me. If you want to be serious intellectuals about India, you have to ask that question. That is the body of knowledge that is given to you through the university, all that you are studying in political science all these Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, uh, Hegel, Marx, uh, you know, Foucault, Adam, Ben, etc. I do not mind. But you have to ask this question, what makes that knowledge useful to me? To what extent is that knowledge useful to me? And for that, you have to ask the Gramsci question, what makes it really different from the other cases? And if it is different from the other cases, what do I do theoretically to grapple with that? <coughs> so that is the historical question. And if Gramsci did not do that, we would not read Gramsci. Gramsci would be a minor, you know, footnote to, to Marx, but he is not. <coughs> so there are six arguments in Gramsci, which are all historical. Why? Because each one of them asks the question, what is specific about the case that I'm studying? I would not go into detail, Arun, about this, because I assume that, you know, students would be familiar with this, at least some of it. So I shall do this rather concisely. Is that okay? Arun? That's okay. okay. So <coughs> the first question, and look at how big the questions are. The first question is capitalism. Italy is going through a phase of capitalist transformation of its society as part of a much larger, broader, Europe-wide and worldwide economic transformation of the world towards capitalism, towards the capitalist mode of production. In different ways, at different speeds, from different points of, you know, different points of origin. So that differentiates capitalism, does not make capitalism uniform, it makes capitalism progressively uh, pluralized, <coughs> but that is what we try to understand. And for that, he uses Marx's thinking in capital, Marx's distinction between the first way and the second way of the development of capital is very famous. I, that's why I don't discuss it very, very much. Um, I have a paper called Outline of a Division of Theory of Modernity. You will see that I use that from Marx, let's say, to this. So late capitalism produces the different logic of the development of capitalism, both in the economy and in the policy. In the economy, because um, when capitalism starts late, as in Germany, the initial capitalist factories are not small manufacturers where six people are uh, employed or 10 people are employed. The first factories are factories in which 500 people are employed, right? And so there is much greater concentration of capital. So the bourgeoisie is in some sense much more powerful, but the bourgeoisie is also much smaller in number. So it's politically more isolated and more vulnerable in a certain sense. The working class starts much larger. The working class begins not in small villages, but in already big industrial cities. So the working class is already given an organization by capitalism itself. So late capitalism, this is very, very well known in Marxist <coughs> thinking. Late capitalism is economically a very different structure from the kind of capitalism that developed in, in, England, and, in England and France. And the other very important thing, of course, is that, um, which is linked to the idea of the passive revolution. There's a whole lot of things which had to be accomplished by the power of the organized uh, political classes under the leadership of the bourgeoisie in 
England and France, very often because the bourgeoisie is more isolated, economically stronger, politically weaker. Uh, because of that, uh, many of those tasks have to be accomplished by the state, not by the political coalition, uh, through a revolution on the street, but by the power of the state. So that's why the revolution is passive. So economic and political, economic and social change happens, but it does not happen as in France, you know, having a revolution on the streets of Paris every 30 years, uh, 1789, 1830, 1848, 1875, not like that at all. You do not see a revolution on the street, but the fundamental profound transformation of the economy and society does not stop. So there is a revolution, but the revolution is passive. <coughs> so passive revolution, but notice something else about conceptualization. Marx understands the difference in economic structure. So he calls it late capitalism. Gramsci adds a layer of political sociological thinking on that. And therefore he is not content by calling it late capitalism. He calls it by a different phrase the passive revolution, with the emphasis much more on the political side. <clears throat> now, the second point on which received Marxism is not sufficient for Gramsci is the analysis of the political side of the capitalist structure. What is the question? Let me again put the question rather dramatically. During the late part of Marx's life, <coughs> Marx does not <coughs> write about it <coughs> very directly. Sorry. <coughs> Engels actually wrote a long, long <coughs> introduction to Marx's pamphlet, The Civil War in France, <coughs> in which Engels encounters this question. Marx has an expectation that with the quick rise of capitalism, the size of the bourgeois, the size of the working class would expand. The working class would become larger and larger very quickly, which is what happened, especially in Germany. He also sees that through political change, demand for the suffrage, after some time, all European societies will have to agree to some kind of universal suffrage. Marx saw 1875, which was the universal male suffrage in Germany, not universal suffrage, not including women, <coughs> but universal suffrage. And Marx and Engels were, you know, clear headed enough to see that very soon it would become universal suffrage. What is the likely result of that? If your society is marked by the statistical dominance of the proletariat, that's the largest class and they have the right to vote, and there are socialist parties, <coughs> it's very likely that they would vote a socialist party into power, which would be a socialist government, and the socialist government would actually bring in socialist changes in the society. So the logic of the rise of capitalism and the rise of democracy, the coming together of democracy and capitalism, would inevitably lead to a pressure towards a socialist revolution through the vote. <coughs> now, Engels writes in 1895, uh, many years, I think 12 years after Marx's death, Engels sees a problem for Marx's theory. That is not what has happened. Universal suffrage has expanded. The proletariat has expanded. The proletariat has become more and more socialist under socialist party. But the proletariat has not moved to demand a socialist revolution. What happened? Gramsci writes in the 19, uh, after the turn of the century. So Gramsci writes about 20, 25 years, 30 years, after Engels vaguely sees the question. <coughs> so the Gramsci question then is, why doesn't the proletariat in a capitalist society want a socialist revolution? And the answer is that Capitalism dominates, not simply by economic power, and certainly not simply by brutal political power and state oppression. Um, 
capitalism survives and capitalism expands and flourishes because of the consent of the proletariat for the continuation and elaboration of the capitalist economy in which they have a slightly better position. So you need a much more sophisticated political theory to account for the presence of democracy, bourgeois democracy in that sense, a democracy which goes with the capitalist economy. And the idea of hegemony is one of the most sophisticated attempts to my mind, even today, to understand the nature of a democratic society based on universal suffrage. So hegemony is a concept which Gramsci <coughs> invents, not because he's actually sitting at a table and thinking of good ideas, you know, what would be a nice idea to have. He's addressing a problem. And the problem is that you have the intensification of capitalism, the rise and expansion of capitalism, but you do not have a socialist revolution. So you must understand something there. And his move to understand that something is the elaboration of a theory of hegemony. <coughs> so this is the second historicist move. Why is it historicist? It's historicist because without that, he cannot understand his time compared to Marx and Engels' time and his society or society in Europe at that time, where there's some amount of development of uh, democracy. The third point. Gramsci realizes <coughs> that uh, this is also implicit in Marx in some ways. Marx realizes that you know, with the coming of capitalism, particularly in the late capitalist countries, the logic of the capitalist economy transforms wherever, wherever it starts, it transforms the surrounding space very quickly. But it transforms that space so quickly, you know, through a very fast process of industrialization, that if it is a large society, then the rest of the society simply does not get transformed like that. So it creates a hiatus between an industrialized region of the economy and an agricultural region of the economy, which happens in Germany. The Western part of Germany around Darland, et cetera, becomes highly industrialized. And Eastern Germany still remains dominated by an agricultural society under the control of Junkers. And the political analysis stems from that. Because of that, the German bourgeoisie has to enter into a political compromise with the Junkers. <coughs> in order to keep its power and in order to uh, head off a proletarian revolution. But the second point, the point that I'm focusing here is a different point, is the point of internal unevenness. In England and in France to some extent, the development of capitalism is internally, regionally much more even. It spreads evenly across the society. But in late capitalism, it produces fast and quick and comprehensive transformation of society in one part, which becomes industrialized. And the rest of the society remains um, agrarian. In Italy, this breakup, in Germany, it is the breakup between the West, industrialized West and the non-industrialized East. In Italy, the North becomes industrialized and the South remains agrarian. So look at the significance that Gramsci places on the Southern question. What is the Southern question? The Southern question is the question of internal economic unevenness that is produced by a very fast moving development of capitalism in a society, right? Which is the historic question because England and France were not like that. But if you're not England and France, if you're Italy, then this is an added question that you have to face and theorize. <coughs> the next two questions are linked to this, but also I think very interesting. Because historicism, what is historicism? Historicism is, historicism is the sharp, intelligent, and incessant interrogation of particularity. You know, what is particular? What differentiates it? What makes it different from others? You know, that's the question. And you cannot be contented simply by 
addressing the question at one level and then say that, well, there's a southern question. Now I am finished. He is not finished. In fact, what is the southern question? The southern question is that the southern part of Italy is almost untouched by capitalist development. Even today, if you go to Italy, you will see that the south is totally different. <coughs> if it is untouched by capitalism, what does it mean? It means that the revolutionary section, if you want to have a revolution in Italy, you have a proletariat in the north. But there is no proletariat in the north. Are there poor people in the north, degraded people in, in are there poor people in the south and degraded people in the south? Of course, you have poor and degraded people in the south, but they are peasants. They're not working class. They don't think like the working class. They don't act like the working class. They don't live like the working class. So you cannot simply take the theory of revolution from Marx and plonk it on the southern question. Why? <coughs> Look at Marx's writings on the peasantry. Marx believes that the peasantry is a sack of potatoes. You know, peasantry is marked by a complete endorsement of the right to property in small land holdings, etc. Peasantry simply cannot overcome their attachment to the right to property and their separation from one another as individual peasants. Marx looks at the history of the French Revolution and he realizes the peasantry very often sides with the reactionaries. So the peasantry in Marx is thinking quite categorically. Marx is absolutely uh, merciless in this, that the peasantry is not a revolutionary force. It's not a revolutionary class. It doesn't even have a sense of class at all. That's why it's a sack of potatoes. The proletariat is not a sack of potatoes, right? Now, if you're an Italian, <coughs> if you have to think of big social transformation, think of revolution. And revolution is the organization of the power of the dispossessed or the power of the degraded in your society for the creation of society which is more decent and uh, less unequal. Then how can you have a revolution in Italy dismissing the peasantry as a political force? But if you need to do that, you have to totally reject what Marx says about the peasantry. You have to look for, uh, you have at least to ask the question, uh, what is the peasantry like? How does the peasantry think? Does the peasantry habitually think in some ways in which there are principles of egalitarianism, principles of equality to which I can appeal, right? So you have to understand the potential of the peasantry as a revolutionary force, can it be made a revolutionary force? And you have to understand the peasantry well. Because France, Marx's focus is entirely on the revolutionary experience in French history. And that does not give Gramsci anything to take forward his project of revolution in Italy, which just across the border from France, but is a totally different kind of society. That's number four. Number five is linked to the question of the peasantry. Why is the peasantry different? Because the peasantry is deeply religious, unlike the proletariat, whose religious beliefs are disrupted by being drawn into living in very large industrial cities. The peasantry still lives in the villages. The peasantry is still very close to the clergy. The peasantry is very, very religious. Right. But look at something very interesting, you know, which actually shows the sharpness of the historicist intelligence in Gramsci. It's very rarely that Gramsci says that it's a question of religion. You know, it's a question, it's the southern question. <coughs> see the questions and how they're interlinked, and how see how the questions are named. <coughs> the southern question, which marks the specificity of the space. The peasant question, which marks the specificity of the social group or class. Then the question is not a question of religion, it's a question of Catholicism. Because religion asks the question falsely, because religion is a more general category. And quite often, <coughs> <coughs> the, 
because Marx is more casual in thinking about religion. Think of Marx as very early writers. Religion is the opium of the people. Marx does not say Protestantism is an opium of the people. He says religion is an opium of the people. So the category that he uses is a much broader, vaguer, abstract category. Gramsci rarely uses religion. He constantly uses Catholicism. So the question is not a question of religion. The southern question, the present question, not a religion question, but the question of Catholicism. Because Catholicism marks what is specific and peculiar about the religious beliefs of the Italian peasantry. You are not talking about the world in general. You are talking about the world in particular. right? And so Gramsci does not use the word religion very often. He always turns to Catholicism, which immediately, implicitly gestures towards something <clears throat> that very recent discussions on Weber and secularism have noted. For instance, if you look at the work of Jose Casanova, <clears throat> public religion in the modern world. What does he say? He says that Weber generalizes on for the whole of modern Europe and then for the whole of the world on the basis of what? On the basis of two countries, on the basis of Germany, deeply Protestant, on the basis of England, deeply Protestant. What about the rest of Europe? The rest of Europe is probably religious, but the rest of Europe is not religious like Germany and France, the rest of Europe is Catholic. Southern Europe, Italy, Spain, Portugal are Catholic, deeply religious, unlike Germany and uh, England. Um, <coughs> Eastern Europe, Poland and the other countries, deeply religious. Uh, Russia, deeply religious, not Catholic, now Greek. So religion is not a sufficiently, uh, you know, it's not a category with teeth. It cannot bite into the specificity on the ground. You need categories with teeth. That is, you need categories which can, which can understand and grasp the granularity of the, of the facts on the ground, which you can do if you go into a category which is more specific, that is more historicist, like using the category of Catholic. So Southern Europe, is, it's not enough to say for Gramsci that Southern Europe or Southern Italy is more religious. It's very important to say that it's Catholic. Saying that Southern Europe is more religious says one thing, and saying it is Catholic actually says something else. Finally, the last point about, <coughs> <coughs> last point about Gramsci, the logic of prioritization. If you look at Gramsci's understanding of Italian history, I won't go into details of this very quickly, but it's an important point. Periodization of Italian history must be done not through abstract categories, right? But through periodization categories that are developed from within the big event of European history, Italian history itself. You know, rather than smothering those categories with larger, more general European periodization categories taken from a so-called history of Europe, which is more general. It's the same point as the, uh, the difference between using the term religion and the term Catholicism, right? Why should, and <coughs> so let me give you an example quickly to illustrate what I'm trying to say. <laughs> what it means is, if you look at Gramsci, you will say that you know, the Periodization markers are not the French Revolution, right? Are not the Paris Commune. These are actually terms like the Resurgiment, right? Or the Renaissance. These are all very important events, not of some kind of abstract European history, but of concrete Italian history, right? So when you try to understand history, and generalize on the basis of history. Here, I'm not going into it, but this is an important <coughs> complicated discussion about Gramsci differing now from Bilthai. Bilthai believes that you, know, you simply cannot generalize. <coughs> Marxists cannot believe that. Marxists believe that you, know, you must actually look for processes which are larger processes, like the development of capitalism. Otherwise, you have to agree with a remark 
remark made by Weber in one context, not in everything. Weber once said that what we can study is not capitalism, but capitalism. That is, we study uh, English capitalism, which is different from French, which is different from, Italian, from German, etc., which is true. But we cannot give up the idea that we also study capitalism. But it shows now, this discussion actually shows, that there are two ways in which you can study something which is general, like capitalism, or like history of Europe, in contrast to studying something concrete like the history of Italy. Right? That is, <coughs> <coughs> you can take the periodization from periodization that is internal to this history. That is how the Italians periodize their history. That the Renaissance is very important, the Risorgimento is very important, etc. etc. And you will see that Gramsci's historical writing is punctuated at one level completely by these internal indigenous periodization categories from Italian history. <coughs> <coughs> In my analysis, I would call this the first order history. But Gramsci is a Marxist, so he also believes that just as there is a history of Italy, history of Italy is happening inside a second order history, which we can call the history of Europe. So Italian capitalism is very specific, but it is also part of a transformation of Europe as a whole continent towards capitalism. So European capitalism is not a myth. European capitalism is not untrue. But European capitalism, as a reality, cannot exist without existing through the specificity of Italian capitalism. So it is actually somewhat like saying, you know, what we do in, in, <coughs> in politics. That is a second order federal structure, right? But the federal structure is a second order structure. It's not the first order. So the logic of periodization and his use of categories like the Sorgimento shows that he's offering us a technique of historical thinking or historical conceptualization, which is far more complex. It basically says that look at the history of the space or the region that you are trying to study. See what its internal punctuations are. See what is the periodization that it gives to itself, to which people are accustomed to thinking about the ruptures of that history, right? Then see what is the larger history of which it is a part. And then <coughs> see, is there a third order history of which it is a part? Let me give you an example from India. You know, Bengal and Orisha, these are both Bengal, Orisha, Bihar, and Assam. These are all parts of Eastern India. And it would be that there is something going on all over Eastern India, let's say Vaishnavism, in the late medieval period, going on in all these areas, especially Bengal and Bengal, Orisha, and Manipur. Right? But there are specificities. So when you do the history of Vaishnavism, if you follow this logic in Gramsci, if you're an Odia, do a history of Odia Vaishnavism first or I'm a Bengali, so I do a history of Bengali Vaishnavism first. Then I recognize that something similar is going on in, in Odisha as well. So let me think of the history of Vaishnavism in Eastern India. And then I realize that this kind of Vaishnav transformation is going on in Benares, in UP, in South India. So let me also have a history of Vaishnavism in India. But the important thing is that I do not collapse, I do not erase you know, the, the stratification of this history from the lower to the higher. And I should not have a periodization which is taken from the higher level, the highest level, and then impose that periodization on the lowest level. And then expect that a point of punctuation which is very important at the highest level, the French Revolution, right? It is not a punctuation in all of European history in the ordinary sense. Right? It is only at the second level, the second order, that the French Revolution is a big point of punctuation in European history. <coughs> right? So, and 
remember that you know we are always victims of this kind of thing. For instance, when uh, and the history of modernity is full of this age of wars, age of extremes, which is taken from an experience of Europe and then generalized across the whole of the world, irrespective of whether in the rest of the world it was a period of wars or extremes or not. Althusser's tradition of historicism, very quickly. <coughs> Althusser, I would not go into details of this, but it's a very, very interesting discussion. Althusser is also partly thinking about this, and he is arguing against the tendency in some types of Marxist thinking of thinking of temporalities which are just too large and too second order or third order, you know, upper order. So in my thinking, I argue that Althusser makes the distinction between times and sub-times, you know, temporality and sub-temporality, and disattributing historical time and temporality in different ways. And what he shows that is very interesting is that when you decompose history in a different way, I decompose the history of Italy between its economic history, its political history, the history of its literature, the history of its religious thought. <clears throat> There's no reason why there would be a kind of punctuation which runs through all these different levels. There can be one, one year, which is very important for literature, because something completely new and original is written, right? That should not be changed by superimposing on it you know, a logic of temporality which I take from the theory of capitalism and then say that, you know, the temporality, the punctuation that I create through an understanding of the history of capitalism is something that we should, I should impose on my understanding of history of religious thought or history of literature. I leave it there for Althusser <coughs> because it's, it's a connected but it's a slightly different question. Let me now finish by <laughs> making two remarks about reading Gramsci. Why do we read Gramsci? You know, I'm an Indian <clears throat> and I read Gramsci not because I'm trying in the next 10 years of my life to become a great scholar of Italian history, obviously. I want to, I read Gramsci because I hope that by reading Gramsci, I shall be able to understand the history, modern history of India, my history, better. And I think there are two ways in which we can see this, how we can learn from Gramsci, or we can follow Gramsci. I'll finish with the question of following. The first is to seek out concepts and arguments which could be applied directly, taking them directly out of Gramsci and throwing it into our history, where it felicitously uh, you know, explains or captures something in the happenings of Indian history, like uh, the concept of the second way, which I used in some of my writings in the 1980s. Partho and I, Partho Chatterjee and I uh, used passive revolution. I uh, used it, I think, slightly less. Partho has uh, used it more expansively and consistently. But I think we were both led by the same logic. That is, lead starting capitalist economies show certain tendencies which can be captured better. And particularly, passive revolution is a concept which tries to staple together you know, the logic of the economy and the logic of politics. You know, that is what made it very attractive for us. Subaltern studies explored Gramscian lines of thought about peasantry. <coughs> as a radical agent in history, both from Gramsci and also partially from Mao. <coughs> but gradually I have felt that learning from Gramsci or following Gramsci, trying to, uh, yeah, following Gramsci should not mean just that. It has a second meaning, and this is the more significant lesson of reading Gramsci, and it should be deeper, which is, to ask, how does Gramsci set up an intellectual relationship between himself and his history? And remember that I said that that question is, how is my history different from other histories? 
and how do I theorize that picture? And in trying to do that, he devises concepts like the batch of revolution hegemony. He theorizes the southern question, the peasantry, uh, Catholicism, organic intellectuals. All these theoretical innovations come from that orientation. That is, I should not think about Italy as Marx thought about Germany. <clears throat> what is that differentiates Italy from Marx's Germany? Which means that those are the things on which I should concentrate and I should theorize those parts. My argument would be that that is how we should look at learning from Gramsci. That is, what are the defining features of the Indian social form? which produces the basic social groups and their social dispositions. And I thought gradually in my work that there were three things which I should try to understand because the earlier Marxist tradition doesn't give me very much in thinking about them. One is regional diversity because India is much more diverse than Gramsci's two sector model of the North and the South. Indian unevenness and diversity is far, far more diverse. And we have to explore that two-sector model and go into something which is much deeper, much more complex. And we must understand <coughs> the historical operation of language because cultural language, diversity in India is linguistically based. So I wrote a paper, I gave a keynote uh, lecture to the German Historical Congress, I think in 1990 or 89, which was called Writing, Speaking, Being. Uh, which was my first attempt to try to uh, get into this. But notice that, you know, I was pushed into that by thinking about Gramsci. The second, which is most important, is caste. Because that was the fundamental structure of social experience in Indian history, even today. So how can you understand anything about Indian history without going into caste? the history of caste, the, uh, you know, the <coughs> intractability of that history, how difficult it is to ascertain anything about caste if you go back like 400 years, but you have to grapple with caste. That has to be the central intellectual uh, problem for anybody who wants to understand Indian history. And finally, because caste is so deeply embedded in structures of Hindu religion, you cannot understand caste without trying to understand Hindu, Hindu religion. And not again religion, but Hinduism. You know, again, going back to Gramsci, don't say that I want to understand religion. Say that I want to understand Hinduism. And immediately Hinduism will show you that Hinduism of the Vaishnavas, Hinduism of the Shaktas are totally different. So you have to understand religion, Hinduism, etc., following through the logic of <coughs> historicism into the particularity. Let's stop here. So for me, following Gramsci is not following Gramsci in that sense. Following Gramsci is not using, just using the passive revolution and the organic intellectuals. But to strike off into a tangent of original thinking, theoretical thinking, away from the kind of thinking that has existed before, with good reason. You know, that actually gives me a great body of thought to uh, use. But that great body of thought does not resolve my question. So I think following Gramsci, I'll finish by saying that, you know, following Gramsci is not following Gramsci. Following Gramsci is the setup between you and your history, the kind of relationship that Gramsci set up between his history, uh, he, himself and Italian history and between himself and the earlier uh, development or the earlier stages of Marxian thought. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sintra. It's very, very, very stimulating uh, talk. And uh, I hope uh, students will have a large number of questions and uh, some of us may ask questions. Now, please, the uh, uh, floor is open for questions, comments, uh, clarificatory doubts. If any, you have. Have you recorded it? I recorded, yeah. Okay, then uh, 
give it to me at some point. I would like to also write it up. And you can see from my last remark that you know, I believe that hmm. there's a very strong connection between being a Marxist and a follower of Gramsci uh -huh. and taking interest in Vaishnavism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. I don't think you can understand your region and my region. Not, not all other regions of India. Sure. Absolutely. And, and also the whole point is that, you know, history, historical knowledge is this kind of stratificational knowledge, you know, that you, mm. something is first order. <clears throat> and then there are, uh, you know, second order, third order, etc. I think India is more difficult than Europe. True, true. Absolutely. Sarbak, you like to start the ball rolling? So, yes, I'm very happy to hear you. <laughs> um, I've been hearing about you and your work for the past I know, 15 years. And this is the first time I got to interact with you directly. So I'm happy for that. Um, When you're talking about internal unevenness, so I was thinking about um, my PhD dissertation, which I did on working class movements in the automobile industry in India, in the Manasar Gurgaon region. So that entire industrial landscape is very interesting in the sense that it's highly industrialized. We have Gurgaon and the NCR and so on, and also the adjoining rural areas sure. and uh, during these strikes and different kinds of protests what is interesting is that many of these uh, workers and unions um, seek support from villagers uh, nearby villagers and including sure. panchayats of, of, of different kinds so sometimes the these these different associations are very supportive of the industrial bodies and sometimes they're supportive of workers right so that is something i found very interesting when you talked about internal unevenness it's very um i thought it's very specific to that industrial landscape of gurgaon faridabad manisar bawal the entire um uh, reason uh, on uh, on the on the lines of Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor, right? So I was thinking, I mean, uh, there is that specificity in terms of protest movements and so on, and at the same time, there is something very general that is happening uh, in different factories, right? Uh, say, for example, uh, labor process or how, how management, uh, managements, the cross unionization efforts and so on. So, so there is something very general that is happening in these factories and, and, and so on, big and small, of course. And this different varieties of responses to management tactics and so on. So that is the specificity of that particular space. And I, I've seen that happening in the past 10, 15 years, 20 years. So how does one understand uh, I mean, um, I think the thrust of your lecture, I mean, the first order was to understand the uniqueness and the second order was something more general. We, we scale it up to see if it is a part of something sure. Sure. Uh, bigger. So um, that, um, how do I formulate that? That tension keeps on happening. I mean, there is, um, um, there is both uniqueness and at the same time, there are certain general features which are operating uh, sure, in, in that space. So um, if we go even further um, after what you have suggested, the following grams and so on, how, what kind of uh, um, conclusions can we draw? Let's say what kind of methodological conclusions can we draw from uh, such a such a such a 
situation which is both very uh, specific which has very certain specific characteristics but which is also very uh, general in in many ways which has similarities with let's say the labor movement or the working class protests in that particular region has similarities with protests in india and elsewhere so i mean um how do we um make a connection between these two uh processes and uh, what kind of i mean i'm interested also in finding a methodological issues uh, which uh, arises from this tension because it would also help us um uh, you know uh, perhaps understand the specificities even better understand the particular you know, better you know yes you know my response is that uh, you know of course what you were saying uh, what you were saying actually brings in something which is more complex because it uh, brings in something which has a dimension of time uh one slightly metaphorical way which i do not always like because people sometimes say things in a way it seems that is very profound but uh it uh, makes it unnecessarily mysterious <coughs> what you are showing is also something that is happening during gramsci's time you know when you set up a factory in manes or little city today mm-hmm. right you are not going to set up a factory like you know factory in england in the 18th century mm-hmm. your factory would be like a factory which is set up in ohio in the united states today mm-hmm. you know with the same technology if it's possible usually it is possible right uh, with some adaptations they might actually say that well not too much of computerization there should be a little less computerized but there are people in india you know who are uh, computer trained and who can be supervisors etc and the people who are managers think of the managers the managers would say of course i went to the wharton school of management i have studied there so i did a bit of my work in the ohio factory and i've been sent here to manage the factory in manisha right so those what is interesting is that marx himself actually saw this this is part of the theory of late capitalism that when capitalism starts late it does not repeat the earlier process you know it foreshortens the earlier process so foreshortening and starting with what is the later is necessarily part of not really capitalism for instance <coughs> if you think of technological change even in the ancient world you know mm-hmm. when the or when the muslim astronomers learned astronomy from the indian they did not learn from the early steps that the indian astronomers made they got the the highest level of astronomical knowledge from the indian you know from uh, aryabhatta not aryabhatta brahmagupta <clears throat> so who makes a mathematical system of that that's the latest that's the most advanced and the muslims simply take that they are not interested in repeating the stages which have gone there so it is not just a capitalist process i think it's a historical process which is <coughs> we find in a more economic form in capitalism and it capitalism actually makes it very noticeable mm-hmm. but that itself produces a concrete you know the particular that you have in gurgaon today is a particular in which there is this kind of superimposition of layers of time you know i'm using the term time slightly cautiously because sometimes people get misled by that you know different types of time so uh, but you understand what i mean yes yes that, that somebody it's like uh, a boy who was a uh, cowherd you know 10 years mm-hmm. back mm-hmm. Uh, whose father had some land in sona and i'm giving you an example from there because i know that area reasonably well <coughs> and suddenly he becomes very rich and his father doesn't know what to do with his money and he gets him a bmw car so he gets a bmw car he goes out he goes to the bars he comes across girls who are uh, you know modern and uh, you know highly educated etc and he gets into a fight right he would find negotiating with that world 
which had been suddenly brought from outside and intruded into his world, you know, which he uh, he cannot avoid. He has to deal with that, right? But dealing with that is very hard because he doesn't have the wherewithal of social uh, socialization, you know, instruction and things like that in which uh, they do that. But that is part of the particularity of Gurgaon. <clears throat> You know, that is what we have to study. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually see this necessarily as a tension. There is social tension. You know, social tension is produced by this. But I think analytically it is fascinating. And what I argue is that historicism would say that you should not expect that fellow you know, to behave in a way which is completely similar to how uh, a boy of his type, you know, born into a similar family, uh, behaved 40 years back, mm -hmm. right? When there was no factory like that at Hogarth. <clears throat> we used to sometimes go to Sona because Sona was a small tourist resort, you know, on on the little hill. And there was nothing in Gurgaon, you know, except for the uh, Air Force station, uh, which was secluded, separated from uh, separated from the city. There was nothing. Gurgaon was actually a very, very small, old style town. Mm -hmm. The kind of town that Sonipat is today, right? Or even Bagpat is today, or something yes. like that. So, historicism would mean that uh, when you try to understand the particularity of the time, you must understand the superimposition and the point of contact between things which are produced in very different times and suddenly brought together face to face with each other and try to understand the specificity. You know, do not expect that, uh, do not say that give it uh, 20 years and uh, Manasar will become like a town in Ohio. Mm -hmm. right? Or do not say that, uh, you know, remember that it is Manasar and remember what kind of town it is. It is the town that was uh, that I knew 40 years back, right? That's also not true. Mm -hmm. But that has been totally irreversibly changed by bringing in this factor, right? So I think the whole point about this specific, about specificity and particularity is precisely this: that history never gives you a chance to go back to something. The history always throws at you something which is surprising because of this kind of process, and particularly with the rise of capitalism and the rise of modernity, this kind of process has become very, very widespread. But that is precisely what historicism would ask us to do, right? Because to essentialize capitalism and to say that give it five years and then all these young boys here would become like the youngsters that you see in New Jersey, right? that would never happen. And then to say that, you know, forget about his clothes, forget about his BMW. He's essentially, uh, you know, he's essentially a cowherd. You know, he's a jart cowherd. Right? Mm -hmm. That's also not true. Right? So that is precisely what history is. And this is why, you know, the categories that you have from historical knowledge is never adequate for understanding what history throws at you. Because historical categories that you have are always, always already, you know, in a certain sense, if you use a Derrida kind of phrase, they're always already obsolete. That is also one of the lessons of, of, of following Ramshi. Mm -hmm. that you are into a different kind of situation and theorize that situation. Mm -hmm. you know, don't look around, you know, for a book which would, where the answers to your questions are hidden. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the problem with conventional Marxism? Not really Indian Marxism. I obsess too much about Indian Marxism because you know I've been affected by Indian Marxism all my life because I've interacted with them. But yeah. when I speak to my friends from Latin America, from the Middle East, it is something which is very, very similar, very similar. And it is also an intellectual disease. You know, to believe that there is some book somewhere, you know, where all my questions are, are answered. Yeah, and, and yeah, my, 
my intellectual okay. life is not to think my intellectual life is to search for that book <laughs> yeah because whenever you want to study trade union movement the first reference is of course what is to be done and i mean that's the end of it so <laughs> yeah so yeah sorry yeah uh, <clears throat> sir uh, i have uh, a very excellent presentation sir i am so happy to hear your lecture sir very two specific query just now you spoke sir hope you are able to listen Yeah, yeah, I can. Sir, I can hear you. Just now he spoke in the case of Gurga, but history doesn't give you chance to go back. So, in fact, sir, recently I had a fellowship at Simla, their Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla, where I did my monograph from land reform to land tightening. So, what is happening that uh, uh, last twenty years? The central government and state government they are going for secure or guaranteeing land tightening. Or what is called the, uh, you have property rights, so it should be secure. You should have insurance, like Western American style of property rights. And sir, uh, that time you had given us a hinting, uh, hints about when you talk the Goa, this uh, survey settlement, this permanent settlement. We had a British uh, background of property rights. Now land reform is gone. Everything is it is totally it is symbolically even lost. But land issues are very important. The Noxal problem, this uh, gender, all this land issues, yeah, even this Gurgaon issue, people are losing land. But pro Indian state selling will liberalize land. Even SCST regulation, land transfer, if you land should be commodity, open wide market. So we should, so what trajectory would like to see? It's a land titling. Means state will give you guarantee. One question. Second, very specific. Let me let me okay, let me okay, okay, let okay. me respond to that because okay, it's an okay. important issue. You know, I'm not a scholar of land relations, so I do not know the detail. But let me tell you this: that land reforms, which were pushed by the Nehru government, you know, they were successful in one sense and they were unsuccessful in another. when people say that it was unsuccessful i'm not particularly upset because i tell them that look uh, think of the great revolution you know think of lenin's revolution or mao's revolution did they achieve what they wanted to achieve now it's quite clear that they did not achieve what they wanted to achieve but if you say were the failures uh, i would not say that they were failures because Uh, do not misunderstand my point i am not saying that they created societies which are very nice etc they made a huge attempt you know to disturb the equilibrium and push the society into something else right which they successfully did in uh, soviet union and china ultimately did not go in a very good direction for various reasons but let us stick to the nehru thing you know what the land reform did was the evicted the landlords the old you know colonial period landlords from their control over land in the countryside and it created an opening for a new group of people you know who are the jodhar in bengal for instance or others you know to emerge and then to control uh, rural society and village society i think what you should do is we should not actually say that we want to go back there because there is no way of going back there what we should do is we should try to think practically about the situation now and then say that you know this is a solution which is better for the people who are poorer or this is you know more just this is less unequal let me give you an example of something that we can learn <coughs> yesterday i was talking to one of my friends she is my age <coughs> she is quarantined in germany and she told me something which shocked me and saddened me she taught all her life in a college and she is retired she said that you know we are very afraid because if we uh, have to go to a hospital to get even a covid test if we want to go to a private hospital the private hospital would immediately ask me for 3 lakhs or 5 lakh rupees or something and then they would give me even the covid test so she said that we are terrified that you know we would be pushed into this kind of expense right now what i found heartbreaking <coughs> was that you know in this country where i live in new york the united states 
this is the most capitalist country in the whole world, right? There's no other country which is ruled by the principles of unrestricted capitalism compared to this country, right? But in this country today, if you are an illegal immigrant, right? But you suspect that you have got COVID, you can go to, uh, go to a place, get yourself tested, free, right? And then if, they fe if you feel that you are unwell, you can go to a hospital for COVID, not for other things, but for COVID, and you will be treated without charge. This country, you know, and think of the dispute that these people have about their medical insurance, which is a horrible, horrible situation here, right? But the interesting thing is that the state takes responsibility. Even Trump state, you know, Trump does not take any responsibility for anything. But even, so understand what I'm saying. You know, this is the logic of the institution. It's not because of Trump being a wonderful man, right? The logic of the institution is such that it says that the task, what is the task of the state? The task of the state is to take care of people when they are in this kind of distress. So if there's a hurricane, you know, if you have a tsunami in South India, right, then you cannot depend on individual charity. The state has to come in and do something. So that is the logic why even in this country, you know, COVID testing and COVID treatment is free. What I find shocking, you know, this is not a BJP, CPM, Congress issue. What I find shocking in India, in our country where people are much, much poorer, why isn't there a demand from somebody saying that, you know, COVID is not anybody's fault, right? So if I have to get tested for COVID or I have to get treatment for COVID, it should be, it should be paid for by the state. Again, do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that it's very simple. You say this and the state would immediately agree, right? I don't think the Modi state would agree. And I do not think even the Mamata Banerjee state in Bengal would agree, or even if the Congress had been here, they would have agreed with this, right? But the thing is, it shows that in our society, we do not have a kind of theoretical thinking. This is theoretical thinking, right? But theoretical thinking, which has seeped into the common sense of the society, right? Which you have to mobilize. And those of you who are in, in government service, those of you who are in important academic institutions, etc., you should, you know, one very important implication of historicism is that do not look for, do not look for instances elsewhere. Innovate. You know, innovate practically in your own situation. So on the question of land, obviously land reform was 40 years back in a totally different kind of situation, right? Now you have different issues coming up because the stage of the development of Indian capitalism is also quite different. In fact, I sometimes feel that when I was young, I used to lecture all the time and write about Indian capitalism. But capitalism was very weak in India <laughs> during my time. It is only now, after liberalization, after 91, you know, that you are getting to see what a capitalist economy is like. But even that is very, very, very narrow in India. So the whole Practical implication of historicism, theoretically, historicism is a theoretical position. The practical implication of that is innovativeness. <clears throat> That's what people people do not see very often. You know, think going back to your question about uh, Charvak's question about uh, Gurdon. Look at Gramsci's discussions about Fordism. Yes. So he's he is quite clear that something is happening in the uh, country where capitalism is much more developed, right? In the development of capitalist production mechanisms, 
which he should understand because those are going to come to Italy. You know, they have not come to Italy. So he is also not some, somebody who is saying that because the Fiat factory in Turin is not using these techniques. I'm not interested in those. He understands that the future is waiting for him. So in some sense, in some form, you know, that would come to him after some time. So when you try to understand the world, the world is many layers. And at each layer, the world has many speeds. You know, temporality. <clears throat> we didn't get into a discussion of temporality, but it has very important implications for the discussion of temporality. You know, we do not live in a single time. I always tell the students when I give a lecture on Indian, uh, Indian politics, that they learn how to think about time. And I tell them <coughs> that take something which is just a physical object. You know, the room in which I'm sitting, you are sitting, and I'm giving a lecture. Think of the structure of temporality of this room. You know, this building was created in the late 19th century, let's say 1891, right? But everything in the room is not from 1891. It was refurbished only five years back. So the windows and the doors, etc., cetera, they're they are just five years old, right? And the microphone system they have installed is just uh, six months old, right? And if you look at the human beings here, uh, most of you are in, the, in your 20s, right? I'm in my 70s, right? So, what is the point? The point is that if we make a diagram of the temporal structure of this class, either physically or socially, you know, we shall find that, suppose we have just uh, five people, four students and me, and one of you is 21, another of you is 27, and the third is 35, right, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm 70. So if we draw a line, you know, at the point where our life began, and as we are coming down, you know, time, then we'll see that, you know, the things which coexist at this point, they are not co-evil, they did not originate at the same time, and they're not co terminal. Right? Mm. I would I would die in the next ten years. Right. You would die in the next thirty years. Right. But time, contemporaneous, is just a line of time where all these things which are not coeval and co terminal, right? Those are different lines across. Right. They have come together for some kind of social interaction, right? So even, even the thing which is so simple, a physical configuration of a class, which has some physical side and some social side, right? Now these are, uh, these have a structure, temporal structure, a structure of temporality, which is fairly complex. Think now, if you have to understand something like the structure of class, in a village in Manisha. It also has a temporal structure, right? And we have to understand what the temporal structure is. So I think there are all kinds of, you know, implications and arguments which come out of this. But Gramsci, I like Gramsci because, you know, Gramsci is extremely complex and extremely subtle at the same time. Okay. And Tupsiga, uh, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Just, just, give, me, uh, give me just a minute. I'll come back yes, in a minute. Yes. Okay. okay. Right. Sarvag, you have a question? Yeah, just a follow up question. Tupsiga, okay. after Sarvag? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have only 10 students, sir. No more. So many of them yes, left. Sir, left. Beggar, uh -huh. so the, so the no time and no master left. <laughs> it's an optional subject, I think. Yeah, the optional. 
Uh, sir, hmm. Charvak bhai and even uh, sir is also discussing on land issues. Uh, 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 I just want to uh, got some clarification also from sir. Okay. Uh, all are uh, that Gurgaon region and Haryana. We all are discussing. Hmm. So I'm working on that. You want to say something? Uh, just uh, some clarification because. Uh, okay. Then uh, okay. Some... Charvak, you you ask. Then let him answer uh, both of you. Hmm. Hmm. But he gives long answers, so I don't have time. <laughs> 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 I worry about that. <laughs> Sir, is it a course on Gramscian social theory or? I'm just political thought. Gramscian political thought. Yeah. So next you bring a plan to bring some more sir i think <laughs> yeah or uh, uh, and uh, rajas the last questions about gurga uh, yeah just to be brief huh? uh, yeah no i didn't want to ask about gurga but um, i was thinking if ramses concept of historicism has any has a place for the concept of space or is it just about time or he <laughs> Uh, historicism yeah. basically thinks you know primarily about time but uh, you know if you're a historicist uh, all kinds of thinking which uh, stem from hegel but we also have that in indian philosophy many indian philosophers like buddhists for instance would very often say that uh, you cannot separate space from time yes so when you are thinking of anything you know any space particularly when you are thinking of social questions mm -hmm. uh, any reference to space always has hidden inside it the question you know of course this space but at what time mm -hmm. and and similarly you know you say that i am talking about the history of capitalism right and then it's always legitimate to say but where Uh, are you thinking of history of capitalism in the whole world, or are you thinking of history of capitalism in India? Are you thinking of history of capitalism in Manisha? You know, these are all legitimate questions, but these are different types of questions. And if you ask it, ask the question about this question, that you know, what makes these questions different? Then the answer is that it's the putting together of time and space. Sometimes the time is kept constant and space is narrow, and sometimes the space is kept constant and time is widened or narrow. Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, sir, it's audible, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for your uh, uh, thought-provoking lecture, sir. Uh, I too working on land acquisition in Haryana. And uh, been through, and uh, also looking through Ramsian uh, thinking and all these things. Uh, I'm having two uh, specific questions, sir. Uh, uh, one is related to a general theory of uh, that. Uh, in the stage of passive revolutions, we stay uh, uh, Ramsian thinking. We say that the both capitalist and pre-capitalist uh, coexist together in passive revolution stage. So, uh, how Gramsci and uh, Gramsci looking uh, this uh, historical trajectory of capitalist development is it leading to a loop or there is a hope for uh, socialist? Uh, uh, I think uh, you know Gramsci. What he uh, means by passive revolution, if you look at it very narrowly, there are two two things that uh, we must understand. Uh, One is that whenever capitalism develops in any society, remember that you know the term capitalist mode of production is very important. Why it is called a mode of production? Mode of production means that you can have an economy in which only certain parts are dominated by the capitalist mode of production. That is simply that there are certain parts where the production mechanisms or the production relations can be called capital. The rest of the economy can have production, which is not capital, right? 
So when we study the capitalist mode of production, we are not committed to saying that the whole economy is a capitalist economy. We can call the whole economy a capitalist economy only if either the whole economy is statistically, you know, the, the dominant part of the economy follows capitalist relation, or the dominant part of the economy follows capitalist relation. It can be that the economy is not statistically, you know, capitalist, that is not that the major part of the economy is capitalist, but the capitalist part of the economy has a dominant relationship with the other. It has the power to subject the other parts of the economy to its own rules or to its own demands. So I think any development of capitalism would show you a picture where some parts are capitalist and some parts are not, right? And we also cannot take it for granted that the moment you introduce capitalism somewhere, it would uh, automatically conquer everything else, right? The people who live in the other parts of the economy, that, that is their livelihood. And if their livelihood is threatened, they would say that we do not want to give up our livelihood. You know, think of the development of capitalism in the European countries. People who were peasants, they were pushed out of their land and became capitalists. There are very, very well-known studies of this. Yeah, that sure. Somebody called Hans Medic. <coughs> did a study of the German working class. And he found, this is the kind of thing that we do not have in India. You know, we do not have these records. He went into the records of the very earliest factories in Germany. And he found that people would come who are in distress in the countryside, they would come, they would work in a factory for two months, and then they would disappear, right? For six months, he doesn't find the same name. After six months, that fellow comes back again. Right? So he doesn't want to be a worker in a factory. He finds being a worker in a factory much more oppressive. He wants to go back to his village and be a peasant. Yeah. But he cannot because, you know, the economic distress actually forces him back again and again. But his son has no village to fall back on. So his son does not show that. In fact, his son actually shows that he enters into a factory at 18 years of age. And he retires from that factory at uh, 55 years of age, right? So it is then that this man has become firmly part of the working class. So in any society where capitalism enters, you would have that kind of situation. And the other thing about the idea of the passive revolution is that uh, the point that I made, that in many cases, in countries of late capitalism, something that is done by a popular revolution in England and, and France is actually done by the state rather than by a popular revolution. So the state has the responsibility for doing for expanding capitalism and things like that. You know, that is the advantage of using the passive revolution idea. And that is also why the passive revolution idea is limited to that. I don't think it should be actually extended beyond that. No. Oh, true. Dipsika, would you like to ask questions? Yes, sir. Two more questions, Dipsika and Hana, they will ask. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, <coughs> taking this lecture. And although I found your article a bit complex and difficult, maybe because of the uh, language, unfamiliarity with the language, I think, uh, it was, I mean, it is going to help me understand and read Gramsci better. Uh, my question to you is uh, this. In your article, you state that uh, in Gramsci, there was an implicit rejection of the theoretical ideas of uh, uh, common turn Marxism, right? And uh, the, the basis of criticism was primarily that it was based on a generalization and universalization of history and not focusing on particularities. But isn't that the flaw of all forms of history, sir? And also in combination with this question, my another question is uh, a historian's task is primarily to generalize, to broadly generalize. And that is what also people like E.H. Carr would say in his book, What is History? He says the same, that a hist historian is distinguished 
because he generalizes so uh, yeah so isn't isn't i mean doesn't this mean that historians are anti historicist historicism no i think you know depends on what is meant by generalization uh, i think there are three different positions you know first let me deal with the first question about what i see um uh, as the difference between commentary predominantly commentary marxism and gramsci's marxism also you must understand that gramsci is also part of the commentary in fact he spent time in russia yes. uh, he uh, knew the commentary because he was part of the commentary in that but i think fundamentally in methodological terms gramsci's thinking is very different from the commentary specifically on this point that the commentary people believe that marxism is scientific in the sense that marxism has actually given you certain rules and laws which you can apply indiscriminately anywhere in history right and that is the power of marxism gramsci clearly does not believe that gramsci believes on the other side that the historical under- and what happens if you think of marxism in the first way what you would do is you would look at the principles of capitalism that you get in marx and all that you can do is to take that book in hand and come to india and then ask has my society got transformed in that direction and to what extent right beyond that you cannot do very much with that right gramsci believes on the other side you know uh, if you are a historicist like dilthey gramsci is not is not dilthey but dilthey would say that you should not generalize Dilthey will say that what you should try to understand, but remember something which is very important. <coughs> Dilthey would say anything that is created by human beings collectively is valuable to all human beings, right? Very, very important. It's valuable to all human beings. And the second point, which is also an important point, is intelligible to all human beings. So he would say that if you have a hieroglyph, in Egypt because it is created by human beings if other human beings keep trying they should be able to understand what is written there right so in principle intelligible because the human mind acts in a particular way right but the important thing is that historicism looks at all human creations with respect so dilthey would not say that you know a santal village because it is tribal and to a certain way of thinking backward you should not look at it he would say that it's human it's created by a group of human beings so it's intrinsically valuable because of that right and the history of humanity is not saying that this civilization is better and developed etc the history of humanity is the activity of gathering together the evidence of everything that human beings have created at every point of time and putting them together without claiming that one is superior to the other you know so there is something which is very democratic about the historic situation but there is also a difficulty with the historic situation because dilthey for instance would say that beyond your understanding what it is right um, and the term that the buddha uses look for the reason vishayan that is understanding not explaining but understanding beyond that the historian doesn't have any other task <coughs> so each car when he uses the term generalize i don't think each car actually thinks very clearly philosophically uh, so his terminology i think is uh, misleading but each people like h car would say two things they would say that by generalize he means two things you know one is not indicated by generalize and the other one is indicated by generalize the one that is not indicated by generalize is trying to understand why something happened dilthey is not interested in that dilthey would say that the fact that something happened is enough for me i'm not interested in why that happened whether it was good for the people or not etc those are not my task 
right? But modern historians, you know, even Hegel, Marx, etc., they would say that no, we should understand what happened and why it happened the way it happened. You know, this is an important task of historians. E. H. Carr would agree with that. E. H. Carr would also say that history means putting different examples of particularity side by side and then trying to make judgments about that. You know, is there one particular form of society which is better, right? My society might not be like that, but in that case, I would want to be like that. So I live in a caste society. I don't have to be a Dalit. Suppose I, I'm coming from the middle class, but I live in my society. I have no idea about how other societies are, right? So I would not have any interest in changing my society. I would simply take it for granted that that way human beings live. But the moment I look at another society and I find that people are not behaving like that. You know, I live in a society where women actually have this much of kungat and they cannot come out without uh, a male, uh, you know, male uh, guard with, with her or something like that. And suddenly I'm exposed to a society where women can actually drive a car exactly like men can do, right? Then in the second case, the effect of history is that I see the possibility of a society which is very different. This is also the use of particularity, right? You are using two particularities, but you using the second particularity now as what some philosophers would call an Archimedean point. Archimedean point meaning a point outside of your world. Uh, Archimedes famously said, that if you can give me a strong point outside the, the earth, I can put a liver there and I can live there, right? So that is the Archimedean point. So this is an intellectual Archimedean point that if you have an Archimedean point, then from there, you can then say that, you know, why should I live in a society which is like this? I can live in a society which is different, but that depends also on particularity. You're understanding that society in its particularity, to put these side by side and then making a judgment, right? So this is something which is not there in Dilthai, at least not in a very pronounced sense. But this is something which is very central to Marx and very central to Gramsci because they're, they're trying to change their society, right? So there are two things. One is that, you know, cognitively, um, there's also a sense in Marxism, that you cannot change your society without understanding. So that's why it's very important to understand how your society functions. But then through history, you see that other societies are different. And you also see that you have an ability as a human being to conceive of a situation which does not exist anywhere probably, right? But a situation which you find more desirable. And the moment you see this is, again, not there in Dilthai. It's very strong in Marx. That the moment you see a society as historical, that there was a point in time where that society did not exist. It has come into existence, right? That means that it can also go out of existence, right? And by using this idea, you can then actually think of conceiving of a society which is satisfactory to you on moral or philosophical ground, and then try to change your society in that direction, right? So E.H. Carr uses generalization, I think, in a broad sense. And E.H. Carr is a very good historian. I think it's a very good book about his history. Mm. But I think I look at it from the point of view of, you know, more, um, you know, more purely from the point of view of philosophy, where terms are used in a, slightly different different way. So E.H. Carr is a very good book on, on what is history. But if you read, let us say, somebody else, who is also an English writer, about 50 years or 30, 40 years before E.H. Carr, Colin Wood, the person I mentioned, the idea of history, you will see how strongly that book is influenced by the German. Because the idea of history is basically a kind of summary of Dilthai, <clears throat> which the English did not know before, at least very closely. People who knew German, people who did German thought of course knew about Dilthai, but other people did not. 
But that book introduced the idea of German historical thought <coughs> into uh, English academic thinking. So if you have read uh, What is History by Karl, which is a very Marxism influenced book, you should read Colin because that is not influenced by Marx. That's actually purely from the German, you know, the German historic uh, tradition. Yeah. Hala, Hala, the last uh, question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, sir, I'm very excited and uh, I'm also a little paranoid <laughs> to ask this question. Uh, Sir, so I might need. Sir, very I'll... late for you. Huh? What, sir? It's quite late for you in, in, in no, India. That is not a problem. Uh, sir, so I might require multiple formulations to get across my question to you. I hope you don't mind that. Uh, so, my, so, while, so during the presentation, you mentioned this uh, crucial to understanding Gramsci is how Gramsci sets up an intellectual relationship with respect to his own history. Now, the question that came to my mind while I listened to that was this. Uh, this is my broader question. How should one set up an intellectual relationship with theory itself? And I want to know what this relationship means with respect to our actual positionality in history society and how that influences uh, what kind of position we hold with respect to theory. More specifically put, uh, the theory of the subaltern or theories of the subaltern. Uh, in other words, are we in, a, are we in a position of privilege to do theory in terms of how much we associate with being the subaltern? Now, uh, as a privileged person, I understand that these associations are more apparent than real. That is, they're not informed by actual experiences of subjugation, rather by the notions of uh, having once been a subjugated nation, a marginalized nation, how these notions have been constituted in our collective consciousness. So, uh, so, so now basically my question is this. So uh, does this sort of uh, an apparent association, which is enabled by an actual real history of subjugation of the nation, does this put us in a position of privilege to do theories of the subaltern, this sort of an association? That's my question, sir. Very good question. You know, let me reformulate your, your question slightly. Not reformulate, I think your questions are clear. <coughs> but I think the you know discomfort from which you are asking this question is, is very good. You know, that subalternity is a very broad phrase. You know, subalternity basically means that there is some kind of an order of power in which some people are dominant and some people are not. Some people are subjugated. But the field of power can also be very diverse in the sense that, you know, just as class is a very diverse field. You know, when we think of class, it's not that we think of some people, you know, who have 50 lakhs every month and other people who have just uh, 500 every month, right? There are infinite gradations between people who are at the top and people who are at the, at the bottom. So first of all, if subjugation is something, but all subjugation, all subalternity is not like that. You know, this is, a field which is the gradational field mm. that you have more or less. Mm. And there are some types of subalternity which are like that. Class subalternity is like that. Mm. That um, uh, I might be middle class, but if I'm middle class, then I can actually see that there are some people who are better off. I can also be, be, see that there are some people who are worse off than me. But all subjugation is not like that. National subjugation is a very different kind. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter whether you're a zamindar or uh, or a sharecropper, you are equally subject to British power, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there are different types of subjugation, and we have to think of mm -hmm. subjugation mm -hmm. uh, again. You know, it's a question of particularity. We must understand that when I'm thinking about this subjugation, what kind of subjugation is this? 
Is it something which is shared by everybody? Uh, and uh, there are lots of discussions and debates in theory about this. For instance, some people believe that uh, you know there is in uh, rational choice theory there is a problem which is called a free rider problem, which is like this: that uh, suppose I am an ICS officer <coughs> at the end of the British period, right? But I tell myself that you know there's a big national movement going on, and it could be that the national movement would succeed after 20 years. Suppose I'm thinking of this in 1927, mm -hmm. and I tell myself the rational thing for me would be not to join the national movement because if I join the national movement, I might lose my job, right? Mm -hmm. And but if I do not join the national movement, I remain a British ICS officer. When the country becomes independent, mm. then people cannot say that you are not independent, right? I shall be as independent as any other Indian, right? Yeah. So independence is not a condition which is divisible, mm. right? And it is also not a condition which can be graded. That is, somebody is more independent and somebody is less independent, right? Yeah. So that determines how we respond to the question of subjects. So I would push aside the question of national subjection because that is the simpler thing. Mm. That your whole country is subjected to somebody else's power. Mm. And your task then is to see that that power is ended. Right? Mm. But the question that you ask is much more difficult from a different point of view. That <coughs> I'm a middle class person. Mm. And I say that, you know, I'm very sympathetic to this award. Mm. And I want to view the world theoretically from a subalternist perspective or a subaltern perspective. Mm -hmm. I think the great question that you ask in the middle of the different things that you said is that is that possible? Right. So let me give you an example. You know, it's a it's a it's a, it's a gruesome example, but let me give you that example because that I give that example sometimes in discussion about craft. Uh, or untouchability. And it is also linked to the problem of experience. <coughs> so there's a lot of discussion about race. Yeah. Right? Some people would say that you know you cannot understand unless you are a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. Some people would go even further and say this is the part of the argument, so you should be careful about this that you cannot understand unless you have been raised. Mm -hmm. right. Now, there is a sense in which the second point that mm -hmm. you cannot understand unless you have been raised, mm -hmm. it's true. Right? Yeah. Depends on what we mean by the term understand. Mm -hmm. Right. But if understand means understanding that having that kind of experience is horrible, Right? Mm -hmm. Not what kind of experience it is, mm. but the experience is horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, I watched somebody having an ice cream from my window. Mm. Right. I'm not having the ice cream, but I can see that the child is thrilled. The child is very happy having that ice cream. Right. So I do not have her experience of having the ice cream, but I can have an intellectual understanding that having that ice cream is very pleasurable. Yeah. Now, if you flip it, I can, without going through an experience of, let's say, mm -hmm. a beating, right, I can understand that the experience of being beaten up very badly is an awful experience. Mm -hmm. That does not make me share that experience, experientially, mm -hmm. right? But it can allow me to understand that the experience of that beating or that experience is a horrible experience to have. Mm -hmm. I personally believe that, you know, this is my position because I'm happy that you asked the question because it's a good theoretical question, it's not a question that can be answered simply by saying that read Marx or read Hegel or read somebody mm -hmm. can give you an answer. We have to think to give it an answer. I personally feel that, let me also give another example to illustrate this. <coughs> I feel that in a situation like this, 
there are two types of danger mm. you know one danger is the danger of detachment mm. let me give you let me give you a different example uh, suppose we are watching the tv and we see an incident where a palestinian boy is demonstrating mm. and an israeli soldier kills him shoot mm. and he's killed and his mother is weeping over his body right mm. now, i would use an argument from you know ancient indian theory where they would say that you know something like this produces it is like actually throwing uh, throwing a stone into a pond mm. right? where the the water of the pond was calm and still now you are throwing a stone into the pond so it's agitated and from the point of agitation there are ripples right and the ripples can be seen in terms of concentric circles mm-hmm. so some indian thinkers will say that <clears throat> when we see something which is very bad like this we have to see where in the concentric circles we are located right mm-hmm. that uh, because we are trying to avoid two danger and which is also reflected in discussions about subalternity and theoretical attempts to understand or side with subalternity you know so some people will come and tell me that you know uh, what are you talking about you are watching the tv mm. and you watch any image it does nothing to you because two minutes after that there is an advertisement you know about an ice cream and then after that there is an advertisement about a car and then there is an advertisement about a dress <clears throat> and <clears throat> so these are four frames which are next to each other so you are as connected to the scene of a palestinian mm-hmm. boy being killed yeah. as you are connected to the advertisement right so you are totally detached <clears throat> you have no connection with that and if you say that you are agitated by this and you want to do something about it you are simply deceiving yourself because you want to deceive others right mm. so what is your connection with with that point <clears throat> the other danger would be so this is the position of detachment mm. that and what is the philosophical ground the philosophical ground is that we do not share experience mm. mm-hmm. i'm sitting in new york in a comfortable chair watching a tv right now the other would be the activist position <clears throat> which would be that i'm so concerned about this that i feel it the way his mother feels mm. right or very close to that i share that experience right so my in a sense my sympathy is a co-experiencing of the event mm. right i feel that both these are wrong i think i think what we should do is we should understand the world mm. as a series of concentric circles mm. you know the mother is at the middle of the circle nobody can be the mother mm-hmm. nobody can nobody should pretend that he or she understands the mother you know that's the non substitutability of experience mm. right mm. the experience cannot be substituted nobody can get into that experience right at the same time that does not mean because we are human being that we are not deeply affected by the experience of other people mm. mm-hmm. affected affected does not mean that i share the experience in that very strong sense mm. but i have an experience of a different kind which is real for me you know my evening is spoiled i wanted to go out to do something mm. but if i'm really moved by that i would say that you know i would i would not be able to enjoy the film today so i don't want to go in indian philosophy there is a lot of discussion about this they would say that this happens very often you know i had a plan to go out for a movie and somebody calls and says that your friend uh, is in the hospital what shall i do very likely i would say that i won't go to the movie today right why i'm not in the hospital right 
but I'm also not completely detached. I do not tell myself that, well, I'm not in the hospital. So let me go to the movie, right? That means that I do not have an identical experience, mm -hmm. but I have an experience of some kind. You know, it's not that my, I do not have any experience. I have an experience of sympathy. So sympathy, I think, is a tricky thing. The important thing is that we should not overplay our sympathy and say that we can understand in the strong sense, yeah. right? But we should also not say that detachment means that I simply cannot understand that somebody who goes through a beating or a rape or something like that is going through an absolutely horrible experience, right? Yeah. There's nothing that stops me from understanding that intellectually, right? And yeah. then having that intellectual perception affect me emotionally. But we should not overplay that. So my critique of an excessively subalternist kind of position, which is very common, mm -hmm. is to say that by sympathy, I co-experience. Nobody can have a co-experience of untouchability. You know, nobody can experience what the Dalit experience not merely an act of, a real act of humiliation, but also the possibility of living in a world where that kind of humiliation is always a possibility, right? Somebody who is not a Dalit cannot have that experience and should not claim to have that experience. <clears throat> but that does not mean that because I do not have that experience, I cannot understand that somebody who has that experience, you know, that experience is awful. Mm. And I should do something about it. I should do something about it intellectually to understand it, to bring it to expression. If I have education and they do not, then I try to bring it into expression. By bringing it to expression, I also hope that there would be lots of people who would say that this should not continue, right? So certain types of social practices quite often um, understand one thing, <clears throat> which is the problem of understanding untouchability and you know Dalit experience in India and Black experience in America. Blacks are fourteen percent of the population, right? Mm -hmm. So blacks by themselves cannot change the degradation of the black. You know, other people have to understand that degradation of the black is a degradation of my society in some sense. Mm -hmm. right? That's why we should end it. But that does not mean that I pretend that I am actually, I can understand fully what the black person <coughs> experiences. And I'll give you an example truly because I, I cannot understand. This is something that I've got to understand over the last two, three months after the killing of George Floyd. Yeah. That you know, the idea that a black man, whoever he is, you know, I'll exaggerate a little bit and say that, you know, you can be Barack Obama. But if your daughter is not recognized as the daughter of Barack Obama, but as a young girl, right, she can face an experience, you know, which is just unimaginable. It's not true about the women but it is true about young black men that you know it, they are immediately seen by people and particularly by uh, policemen right as threats right which mm -hmm. triggers a certain kind of social emotion so it's a, the reason i liked your question is that it's a very fundamental question for people like us we are middle class people we teach in the university, we write things. Gayatri Spivak touched on some of these things, you know, mm -hmm. in her uh, essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? I don't think she went uh, into great complexity in that essay. But I think what the essay does not discuss very clearly is the politics of sympathy. You know, politics of sympathy, I'm now using sympathy in a technical sense as <clears throat> in the sense in which Adam Smith uses sympathy. Adam Smith said that human beings are not selfish, human beings are made in a way where they're self-oriented. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So if I have an apple, I bite the apple from one side. I cannot share the apple with my wife. You know, she takes a bite which goes into her body. I take a bite which goes into mine. Right? There's nothing we can do about it. It's not self mm-hmm. God or nature created us like that. But Adam Smith would say that but God or nature has also instilled something in us instinctively where when we are walking, I'm walking with my wife and she stumbles, right? I would not have to go through an intellectual operation and ask, should I stop her from falling? There's an instinct in me which would, which would force me to push my hand out and to try to keep her from falling, right? It's not an intellectual activity. Gramsci is very good at this. It's not an intellectual activity. It's a pre-intellectual response. It's an instinctual response, right? And so we can use that kind of argument and say that it is not co-experience, right? Co-experience or a claim made about experience, I think, is false, right? But to say that I'm left completely unmoved by that is also false. So my answer to your question would be that we sh- we have to be very, very careful in measuring where we are related to a particular social event. Mm. Particularly when it is linked to subalternity of any kind, you know, subalternity mm-hmm. violence or whatever. So if we claim that we understand it the way the people who are undergoing it understand it, mm-hmm. I think we are making a horrible mistake. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, if we say that we want to understand, we want to do something about it, I don't think we are saying something which is uh, unreasonable. So, uh, can I um, ask one more thing? So, so I recently, I, I was just connecting all that was discussed to this book that I recently read. Uh, it's Charlie Lullabies by uh, E. Valentine Daniel. Say that again. Chat lullabies, chapters oh, in an yeah. anthropo- it's, by, uh, it's by one of our friends here, you know, Val, Val Daniel. Yeah. Val yeah. Daniel. So, uh, so in that book, uh, he he specifically mentions this in the introduction that he is he's he has permitted theory. He has permitted even theory with a vengeance. I think these are the words, if I'm not wrong. Uh, permitting theory with a vengeance to understand the phenomena that is being studied. And then towards the end of the book, he literally dismantles all the theory that he's built until then. And he says, uh, in humble submission towards the enormity of the phenomena that's being studied. So I was again trying to understand this, uh, my relationship as a reader with what I was reading. And then I found it, so, so and he's mentioned this, he, he hasn't had any, again, his association with the people of Sri Lanka and what they're going through is in a sense apparent because he hasn't had direct experiences from what is being written in the book. But I found, uh, I found, that, I found it acceptable when he said that he is permitting theory with a vengeance or towards the end when he dismantles the entirety of his theory. So me finding it acceptable or him even saying something of that sort is from that apparent association, right? With that, how how would you see that, um, that that sort of an approach to doing theory? How would you see that in the light of no, this Here, I think respect? theory is used in two different senses in hmm. the two things that you quote. Uh, we use theory to understand a whole lot of things hmm. in the sense that, you know, theory actually gives you, gives us concepts, hmm. uh, strings of argumentation and things hmm. like that, hmm. you know, which uh, sometimes we cannot devise those on our own. Uh, there's some very intelligent people who have done that thinking for us, and we use that thinking. So using theory in that sense, I think, is always uh, helpful. We cannot do without it. 
sometimes we use theory without knowing where the theory is coming from, or even knowing that there is a theory. Mm -hmm. so initially, he is using theory that way. But finally, when he says that I would dismantle all the theory mm -hmm. that I have uh, used, I wouldn't take that literally at his word, because I think that attitude is also a theoretical attitude. You know, mm -hmm. you're thinking mm -hmm. about what is my relationship to something that I've just described. Mm -hmm. That is a theoretical question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a political question. You are not asking, should I go and, and do mm -hmm. something? Mm -hmm. Right? It is not an experiential question. That is, can I experience it? You are you're asking the question, what is my relationship with the experience mm -hmm. that has been presented to me? Or if it is your work, the experience that I captured through my mm. field work and to which I gave expression mm. by using theories of various kinds, I gave expression. What is my relationship with that? That is a theoretical question. Mm. That is precisely a theoretical question. That's a very important theoretical question. Because after all, the most important thing about theory is that theory actually makes you self-aware. Mm. Theory is reflexive. Mm -hmm. Reflecting in the sense that theory actually turns your attention towards yourself, right? And mm -hmm. uh, critical in that sense. For instance, think of how Kant uses the term critical, which is the first use of the modern, first modern use of the term critical, that uh, critical philosophy. Why is critical uh, Kant's philosophy critical? It's critical because Kant basically says that the difficulty of knowledge does not come only from the fact that the object that I'm trying to understand is hard to know, yeah. right? The difficulty of knowledge sometimes also comes from the fact that we do not quite understand the means that we are using in order to get that knowledge. And that means is our mind, you know, our capacity to know. So there are limitations to our capacity to know. Let us try to understand the, the instrument that we are using in trying to know something. So difficulty of knowledge is partly in the object and partly in the subject, partly in the knowledge apparatus that is inside ourselves, which we are trying to do. So cri being critical then means critical of your own position and of the limitations and the specificity of your position, right? That is what being critical means. And when you say, uh, after writing a book like that, that mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think what my relationship is with that. That is typically, you know, the meaning of being critical. Yeah. You are trying to evalu evaluate, you know, what is your relationship with that, which I think is a theoretical, it is the most important theoretical question, uh, actually. Mm -hmm. One definition of philosophy is that philosophy is thinking about thinking. Yeah. No, which can mean many different things. One thinking about thinking might mean that you know I'm thinking about the different ways of thinking which I can get from different philosophers. But thinking about thinking can also mean, and in this case it does mean yeah. something else, that it is thinking yeah. about my own thinking. Yeah. That what can I do, what I cannot do, you know, what kind of moral position can I take, what I cannot take. Things like that. You know, those are genuinely important theoretical questions. And Gramsci, I think, is the greatest philosopher in thinking about that, Marx and Gramsci. But Gramsci more now because, you know, we use the term subaltern following yeah. from him. And we use that generally for all these cases of subject. Yeah. So that's why I think it's very important to see that. In, Gramsci does not discuss this very directly in his own writing. But I think it is implicit in his, in his writing. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Last we an end to this talk because we already spent uh, nearly three hours <laughs> by now. Yeah. Okay. I have the energy to go on for another one hour, but I am having, I am losing <laughs> energy. <laughs> okay. Just to sleep by now. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Must thank uh, Professor Kabiraj for coming here for. Give a very stimulating talk. You know, one take off for today's talk from from your lecture is that uh, if you want to um, develop a, a theory of difference or theory of uh, historical difference, 
it is important for us to theorize the the experience of or practices of the subaltern. Yeah, of course. That's a very important point uh, made by him. And uh, in fact, in India, Indian context, uh, you have thinkers like uh, Ravindra Tagore, K. C. Bhattacharya himself, uh, many others who have taken this view. Therefore, uh, whether it's Gramsci in Italy or uh, Ravindra Tagore in India, you have thinkers who think of uh, similar you know, scales of logic and uh, they apply same similar standards actually. And therefore, uh, that is a starting point, the first order of uh, what uh, Kabiraj calls first order of uh, uh, historical thinking begins with uh, negotiation or dialogue with the masses. There's uh, one way of getting rid of uh, uh, colonial or uh, you know Western <laughs> subjugation, whatever you call Indian context. That's an interesting point. And uh, there are many more uh, interesting lessons from uh, today's lecture, but this is the first starting point. And if you lose this ground, you lose everything. If you lose, if you lose the first ground, you lose, and you hang on to the second, third, then uh, okay. it doesn't make sense. You lose everything. It's about the uh, primacy of the first uh, point, as uh, Casey Bhattaja says very unambiguously in his uh, Swarajin ideas. The same thing. That's a point made by Ravindra Tagore, actually. Therefore, uh, it's important for us to learn this uh, lesson from Professor Kabira's uh, talk today. And I hope uh, my there are few students now, and uh, I hope the tech will be <laughs> they will be taking forward your ideas for forward. <laughs> and I'm uh, very grateful for you for spending a lot of time with us. So thank you, Professor Kavira. Thank you. Hey, Good night. Good night. <laughs> thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir.